Kenya's oldest colonial legacy are its tea and coffee industries, two commodities which to a large extent have escaped the global economic meltdown. A drought as well as continued demand are the reasons why companies operating in this sector are seeing profits soar. Three seasons of failed rains and strong global demand for tea have to a large degree helped to escalate prices to record highs. Towards the end of last year, tea companies like Kapchura and Williamson saw pre-tax profits more than triple. But poor rains mean less output, which ultimately means lower growth in this sector. And for tea and coffee, output is everything. For listed tea and coffee producer Sassini, majority owned by the Samir Group, the main strategy is to protect its profit margins from external factors, which is why it's focusing on creating value addition products. You see, for a long time, Sassini was mainly involved in the growing and the marketing of tea and coffee. But then we, in 2007, went into the coffee milling business. And uh, two years ago also, we went into the Savannah Coffee Outlets, which are the added value, where we're able to sell our coffee, uh, tea and coffee products. We normally say from the garden right to the cup. Uh, really to diversify our income and to reduce our dependency on factors beyond our control like exchange rates, weather, uh, world prices of the commodities. Um, so we really still feel this is the right way to go. And if we can increase our proportion of income from the value added uh, new businesses, we, we feel that this is really the right way to go and we can cushion ourselves against any, any, any huge fluctuations which are affected by the factors beyond our control. For Sassini, power is a production headache. It forms one of the company's biggest input costs. This is a trend across the board when it comes to doing business in Kenya. And for regional cement company Ati River Mining, this is no different. Our power costs are about five times the power costs in um, Egypt, for example, or if you were to go down in South Africa. Now, it does increase the cost of production because 52% of the cost of production of clinker is energy. And if your energy is uh, five times the cost, your cost of production goes up. What does that do to us? As a company, we are competitive in terms of technology. We are efficient in the ways we manufacture, but still we are expensive because we have no control on energy. Uh, it makes us more, uh, more uh, expensive, that's correct, but the only way to, uh, uh, to compete in the market is to have efficiencies in other sectors, uh, value more, uh, deliver, deliver more value to the customers. Currently, Kenya's energy capacity is around 1,296 megawatts, two-thirds of which is produced by Kenjin, the country's main power producer. Kenjin plans to spend 5 billion US dollars to almost double capacity by 2014. And to do this, it's issued a 10-year bond worth 15 billion shillings, the first corporate bond on the Nairobi Stock Exchange's new automated bond trading system. This, along with government's heavily oversubscribed infrastructure bonds, have highlighted investor interest in the country's 2030 development plans and have led to improved liquidity in the secondary bond market. Its performance was previously stunted by an ineffective manual trading system. Infrastructure will continue to remain the key focus of our development agenda because first and foremost, as you've correctly recognized, the spillover effect that we'll have, the, the ability to, to create additional jobs, increase disposable income, and hence also act as a stimulus to the rest, to the rest of the economy. Uh, you've talked about the uh, infrastructure bond that we recently issued, that we are very uh, happy with and satisfied with the result of that infrastructure bond. It is the first ever infrastructure bond that has been issued by Kenya and in fact in the region and it was issued domestically and it actually led us to, to understand that there is capital out there that is willing to participate in development and we've not actually looked into it. These are other revenue lines that we will now be looking at especially as we go into the new fiscal year to see how we can increasingly tap on domestic uh, uh, resources to assist uh, government meet its developmental uh, um, objective and agenda. The bond market is currently worth over 473 billion Kenyan shillings. Government paper makes up two-thirds of trade. Analysts say this could easily increase to 3 trillion Kenyan shillings by 2013. However, investor appetite for bonds still pales in comparison to interest in the equity market. And in a bid to improve overall liquidity, the industry regulator, the Capital Markets Authority, in association with other industry players, plans to double the market cap by 2012. 
That would also include demutualizing the Nairobi Stock Exchange. We want strong institutions that have a strong uh, corporate governance um, and integrity and we want that assurance uh, by demutualizing our stock exchange so that they can actually perform their first line regulatory functions uh, which um, which would be good uh, and obviously having a self-regulatory organization uh, that would really be the Nairobi Stock Exchange. So we believe this really will be a win-win situation and it will obviously create a shareholder uh, value uh, once it's demutualized because there will be the creation of shares uh, which is not currently in place and the share uh, the, the shareholders will demand that they get the maximum benefit out of that particular entity and we believe that will also be a good uh, situation for our market currently so that we can even realize the dreams of our country of vision 2030 of increasing our market capitalization by um, of, uh, uh, from 50 to 90 percent uh, by 2012 uh, as well as increasing our bond market um, uh, as a percentage of DDP to about 30 percent by again year 2012 those are the two targets we've set out for ourselves and if investor interest in the listing of East Africa's most valuable company, Safaricom, is anything to go by, then this looks possible. In what was the most publicized listing in East Africa ever, Safaricom entered the public domain with just about everyone buying shares. And at the heyday of global financial markets, spectacular returns seemed almost a given. But this wasn't to be. We had a shareholder revolution in Kenya. We have nearly two million individual retail shareholders. This is a huge number and it's, uh, it's well north of what you've got in South Africa. It's an extraordinary sort of Thatcherite type revolution. And I think what happened here was twofold. The retail investors gorged on Safaricom. Uh, they all bought far too much, uh, expecting to be able to flip it reasonably quickly. Everybody got caught long and wrong. And it, I think the trigger for the, for the retail investors to troop back into the market is once we cross five on Safaricom. With foreign investors, clearly, you know, they exited as fast as they could. They checked out uh, once they saw all the troubles happening. But in the last few months, it is the foreign investors who've been buying the Nairobi Stock Exchange. For example, Safaricom now has 16% foreign investors compared to 11% not so long ago. So it is, it is those folks who've actually picked up the slack. Safaricom, formerly state-owned, did reach its initial public offer price of 5 Kenyan shillings towards the end of last year. But analysts say the market is undervaluing one of the region's most promising growth stories. The company practically pioneered the mobile banking space with its M-Pesa service, and now it's offered the same service to Kenyans living abroad who want to send small amounts of money back home. Our M-Pesa product is not designed for large amounts of money. You can do large transactions on M-Pesa, even on an international basis. So you, it's, this is for people who are sending money home in a sm small amounts of money uh, who can't really afford the, the, the sort of major money transfer companies. You, you, our, our product is distinguished uh, from the other brands that it's, it's, you don't have to go to a bank, you go to an M-Pesa store or you go to a Western Union store. And we will soon be seeing M-Pesa stores on the high street of the UK where Kenyans living in the UK can, can go in and uh, send money home. Safaricom's success is just that, making its product offering small and affordable enough for almost any consumer to purchase. If you look back over the last few years, you need to indigenize your products. You cannot assume just because it worked in South Africa or it worked somewhere else, you can just drop it in here and it's going to work. It's not. You've got, you've got to consider the, 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 the local side of things. You've got to consider what resonates with the people here. It's a vet, you need to indigenize your brand. And then I think the lesson across Sub-Saharan Africa is you need to small size also. You need to be able to sell, you know, Safaricom last week announced they're selling a five bob um, uh, up, uh, a credit for the phone. Five bob is what? It's less than 10 US cents. I mean, you would, people would say, well, well, there cannot be any sense in that. But there is, and Africa is about making everything bite-sized for the consumer. But you know, you can be sure there is an enormous market once you do that.